Chapter Thirteen of Confessions of a Book Lover by E. Walter Walters. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter Thirteen: A Pilgrimage. So we saunter towards the Holy Land till one day the sun shall shine more brightly than ever he has done, shall perchance shine into our minds and hearts, and light up our whole lives with a great awakening light as warm and serene and golden as on a bankside in autumn. These were the last words I heard from my friend's lips. He had a serious relapse shortly after our visit to the country, and died within a few days. And now I am divided between a deep sense of personal loss and my duty to his memory. He would, I know, have me look upon his journey to the other side in the light of a pilgrimage, gone upon bravely, cheerfully, in perfect confidence. By my side is a letter in which he speaks of this attitude in the course of a reference to our day in the country. I have been reading, he says, a volume of Mr. A. C. Benson's essays, procured from a circulating library, and am filled with gratitude for their soothing influence. The following passage from his essay on beauty will recall the conversation we had at our last meeting, our day in the country. Nature has a magic for many of us, that is to say, a secret power that strikes across our lives at intervals, with a message from an unknown region. And this message is aroused by symbols. A tree, a flash of light on lonely clouds, a flower, a stream. Simple things that we have seen a thousand times have sometimes the power to cast a spell over our spirit, and to bring something that is great and incommunicable near us. This must be called magic. For it is not a thing which can be explained by ordinary laws, or defined in precise terms. But the spell is there, real, insistent, undeniable. It seems to make a bridge for the spirit to pass into a far-off, dimly apprehended region. It gives us a sense of great issues and remote visions. It leaves us with a longing which has no mortal fulfillment. I mention this, the letter continues, because it seems to me to lead to certain deep issues of life about which I have seldom spoken. I have always felt a certain diffidence in touching upon matters relating to the soul and the life hereafter. Yet I have not let others do all the thinking. I have had my own thoughts, my own visions. But after all, refined speculations are of little use if there be not some tangible belief at the back of them. I like the passage just quoted. And I like the author's reference in another part of the volume to the guarded city of life. But I think the following passage makes the strongest appeal, for all may participate in the deep yet simple feelings expressed. What are the thoughts of the mighty unresting heart, to whose vastness and agelessness the whole mass of these flying and glowing suns are but as a handful of dust that a boy flings upon the air? How has he set me here, a tiny, moving atom, yet more sure of my own identity than I am of all the vast panorama of things which lie outside of me. Has he, indeed, a tender and patient thought of me, the frail creature whom he has molded and made? I do not doubt it. I look upon the star-sown spaces, and the old aspiration rises in my heart. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come into his presence! How would I go, like a tired and sorrowful child, to his father's knee, to be comforted and encouraged, in perfect trust and love, to be raised in his arms, to be held to his heart? He would but look in my face, and I should understand without a question, without a word. When I think of this passage and others which were included in letters written by my friend during his illness, I see clearly that he must have realized that he stood on the brink of the unknown but no fears were expressed. Indeed, I gathered nothing from his letters regarding his physical condition. He made no mention of sickness or pain, dropped no hint of weariness. On the contrary, the letters of which I speak struck a deeper and truer note of cheerfulness and courage than any previous communications from his hand. I like to think that he continued, as of old, to speak of his rose-colored spectacles, his point of view. The secret of a happy life, he remarks, in the letter from which I have just quoted, consists in immediately clearing away the specks of dust which are so apt to fall upon one's rose-colored spectacles, the little annoyances, the petty worries, the hundred and one little dark specks which I leave you to name at your leisure. Then follows a deeper note. T. 
taken, I think, from Epictetus. Happiness is not in strength, or wealth, or power, or in all three. It lies in ourselves, in true freedom, in the conquest of every ignoble fear, in perfect self-government, in a power of contentment and peace, the even flow of life, even in poverty, exile, disease, and the very valley of the shadow of death. So you see, my friend continues, there are also dark fogs and thick mists against which the would-be cheerful man must contend, deep trials compared to which our daily petty annoyances are indeed but specks of dust. But these too may be overcome. The truth is the cheerful life is neither a matter of circumstance nor of temperament. It is a gift of God, and we can covet no better gift. The black hag of care can no longer sit on the shoulder of the man whose cheerfulness is the child of reason, not of impulse, whose heart is light because he can trust, not because the sky is blue and the world smiling. I wish I could give you some account, from personal knowledge, of the way my friend spent his last days. This I cannot do, for many miles stood between us. But I am told by those who nursed him that up till the end his mind retained its clearness and vigor, that he never ceased to take an interest in his surroundings, in the great world outside his little room, in the many ill-favored ones whom he had befriended. Close by my side stands a shelf upon which are stored a number of volumes from his library. They are typical of his treasured collection, some of the best of the world's best books, each volume showing signs of much reading and meditation, each page bearing marginal notes, original observations and thoughts from other sources, showing how one great writer differed from others, or in the main, was of like opinion with his contemporaries. Many of the observations seem to me to be remarkably fresh and interesting, quite simple it is true, but of the type of simplicity that captivates. I shall hope to set down some of these together with the passages to which they refer. Here is one example which will serve to convey an idea of my friend's manner of commenting upon an author's words. The passage in point reads thus. When thou hast been compelled by circumstances to be disturbed in a manner, quickly return to thyself, and do not remain out of tune longer than the compulsion lasts. For thou wilt have more mastery over the harmony by continually recurring to it. By the side of this, written in lead pencil, are the following words. Might not human life be compared to an orchestra composed of all kinds of instruments? I mean that each of our natures is, so to say, an instrument, some more pleasing and seemingly more useful than others, but of equal value when played in accord with the combined orchestra. And if we at any time drop out of tune, is it not because we have failed to give our attention to the great conductor of all? They tell me that towards the end he referred repeatedly to the help he had derived from keeping his spiritual vision clear, his faith unclouded. So far as I can gather, his closing words were these. Faith kept in lively exercise can make roses spring out of the midst of thorns, and change the briars of the wilderness into the fruit trees of paradise. End of chapter 13 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 14 of Confessions of a Book Lover by E. Walter Walters This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 14. Farewell. I have attained my desire. I have introduced you to a true book lover. And if you wonder why I have chosen a life shadowed by sorrow, I answer that love comes that way. Tis no new teaching that which shows how sorrow and tribulation are the paths by which men travel to perfection. We start upon life's journey with a glad cry, but many fall from the rank some distance from the first milestone and fortunate are the fallen ones who find an open book by the wayside. It was thus the love of books came to my friend of the rose-colored spectacles. Shadows fell across his path, and he fell from the ranks. But out of the shadows came sweet voices, telling of gentle fancies and strength-giving realities. This was the road, need I hesitate in confessing it, upon which I, too, came by the love of books. Oh, how much we book lovers owe to those little sheets of paper that teach us, comfort us, open their hearts to us as brothers. We ought to, and surely do, reverence books. 
to look upon them as good and mighty things, whether they are about religion, or politics, farming, trade, or medicine, they are messages of the teacher of all truth. More cannot be said. And so, farewell, fellow book lover. May you find upon the way many wise and friendly books. But wait. I hear as though voiced in clear tones the beautiful passage to be found in the little book friend whose name is on so many lips. Let me follow the pleasing example of my friend of the rose-colored spectacles. Let me echo the brief passage before I take leave of you. It is scarcely farewell, for my road is ubiquitous, eternal. There are green ways in paradise and golden streets in the beautiful city of God. Nevertheless, my heart is heavy. For viewed by the light of the waning year, road-mending seems a great and wonderful work which I have poorly conceived of and meanly performed. Yet I have learnt to understand dimly the truths of the three paradoxes, the blessing of a curse, the voice of silence, the companionship of solitude. And so take my leave of this stretch of the road, and of you who have fared along the white highway through the medium of a printed page. End of chapter 14 Recording by Philip Gould End of Confessions of a Book Lover by E. Walter Walters